It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Orion Samuelson is well known to many of you in the audience, particularly those of you involved in farming, who have relied for decades on his timely reports regarding the markets, the weather, and U.S. agricultural policy. For more than half a century, he has been a staple of WGN Radio's programming. But more recently, his audience has expanded beyond that station's considerable market as he hosts the popular This Week in Agribusiness on RFD TV. We in Western Illinois understand the importance of agribusiness, and it was one of the key factors that led to the decision to build the Center for Science and Business. The future of our region, and for that matter, this country and the world, will be determined by our ability to grow and distribute food and commodities efficiently, safely, and profitably. All of the disciplines housed in this remarkable facility, from biochemistry to computer science to accounting, will be integrally involved in the continuing development of agribusiness. No one understands this synergy better than our speaker, who has traveled the world reporting on the latest scientific developments in agriculture and emerging trends in the marketing of agricultural products. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Oren Samuelson. Wow, I am so impressed by what is happening here today because of the contribution it's going to make to the way of life, not only in this community, but to the world. And the opportunity to visit with students, the opportunity to visit with faculty and uh, many friends who are here and uh, are alums of this, uh, of this college. I thank you for the invitation and I thank you for the opportunity. I have a different perspective of this building than you have because I saw the roof. <laughs> Air Orion by Cessna 210, our final approach to Monmouth International Airport, <laughs> took us right over the top of the building at about 500. It has a beautiful roof, Maury. Really beautiful roof. But it also gave us the opportunity to see how beautifully it fits into the overall campus community. So whoever chose the site, you did very well. Just a few moments today, uh, agriculture, of course, uh, has been my career. And uh, finally, <laughs> 20 years ago, I couldn't spell author, and now I are one. <laughs> and, uh, uh, finally wrote the book that I'd been talking about a long time. And the title of the book, I think, fits what's happening here today. Because the title of the book, based on my lifetime experience, You Can't Dream Big Enough. And there has been some big dreaming taking place on this campus. And some big dreaming involving this center. But now you got to dream bigger. And that's what it's all about. And in the book, the title, of course, is aimed at young people, those of you who will be graduating from this school and other schools all across the nation, because the challenge is yours to take the knowledge you have gained and then apply it in a practical way that will benefit all of us. And you can't dream big enough based on my own personal experience. Growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin without electricity, without a tel my grandchildren can't understand this at all, <laughs> without a telephone and, uh, and without the indoor plumbing and without all of the modern day fixtures, and then finding myself doing what I'm doing today. I could never have dreamed that I would be standing on this campus today helping with the dedication of this center. And in the graduating class from this school this year, we'll probably have medical researchers that will develop something startling and new, maybe a cure for cancer. We'll have people who are geneticists who will develop new plants and the capacity to use less acres to produce more food for the growing world population. 
and don't laugh. It's perfectly possible that someone in this graduating class from this school could become president of the United States. It can happen. And that's why I tell young people today to dream big, because you can't imagine the opportunities that are out there waiting. And I don't say this to brag, but I could never have imagined that I would go to 43 countries with a television crew to look at agriculture, that I would visit all 50 states, that I would meet seven presidents, that I would work and become involved with some of the great minds of the world. I could never have dreamed that as a teenager sitting on that three-legged milking stool on a cold January morning milking cows because we didn't have electricity so we had to milk by hand but don't forget this you never forget it because i am the five-time cow milking champion of the illinois state fair <laughs> don't mess with these hands but two topics i want to briefly cover with you today and one of them deals with a chapter in the book that I entitled, Choose Your Heroes. Heroes are important. For individuals to look up to the accomplishments of people. And I want to share just three of my heroes. First of all, Dr. Norman Borlaug. Dr. Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1971 for being the father of the Green Revolution. And the title of his biography is The Man Who Saved a Billion Lives. And that's literally true. I interviewed Norman Borlaug at least 40 times. And every time came away with knowledge that I didn't have before the visit. We did have some things in common. He passed away about a year and a half ago at age 94, still doing research at Texas A&M University. He developed rice that would grow to maturity without the head stepping into the water and rotting. It stood straight till it was harvested. He developed wheat that would grow in tropical climates, did his work in Mexico and India back in the early 60s and turned India from a wheat importing nation to a wheat exporting nation. The things we shared in common, he was an Iowa farm boy. We both grew up on farms. We both went to one room, eight great country schools, and we were both Norwegian. That's where the similarity ended. <laughs> he went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. I just talked about it. <laughs> but if you've not had the opportunity to read the book, The Man Who Saved a Billion Lives, you will find it inspiring and challenging. I would recommend it. Another hero, his name, Harold Brock. He too passed away in his mid-90s about two years ago. I never ever thought I would meet someone who worked for the Henry Ford. But Harold Brock worked as an apprentice for Henry Ford when he was 16 years old. And when I met Harold and interviewed him the first time, I mean, matter of fact, he said, yeah, I would sit in the room and uh, he'd be talking to Thomas Edison and uh, Washington Irving and uh, Alexander Graham Bell, like it happened every day. And I guess it did. But Harold Brock took his experience and his learning. And in the 1930s, Henry Ford said, we've got too many horses on farms in America, making too much manure, eating too much hay. Harold, you've got to design a machine that will help farmers farm without horses. Now he said, I have figured out what it costs to maintain a team of horses and feed them and harness them for a year, and it's $845. And so you are going to have to design the machine and have it sell for no more than $845. Harold said we never dared tell him what it cost. <laughs> but from that came the Ford tractor that gray squatty tractor that you saw on farms all across America. When Henry Ford died, Harold said, I left Ford Motor Company, John Deere hired me, went to Waterloo, 
and designed another iconic tractor, the John Deere 4020. You remember the two-cylinder putt-putt tractor. The John Deere 4020 was the step away from that. One individual, the designer of two iconic tractors in the world that again changed people's lives. I met both of them, Dr. Borlaug and uh, Harold Brock, and I'm so much richer for it. The third hero is one that I never had the opportunity to meet, but I did sleep in his bedroom. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> the best friend that farmers have ever had in the White House, and let me quickly tell you why. In the 1860s, when we were in the midst of a civil war, this, and this is why I don't understand why we can't get things done in Congress today, because in a period of about seven months, this is what happened. On January 1st of 1862, the Homestead Act was implemented, and it changed America. It went for 123 years. It ended in 1986. And during that time, the government distributed 270 million acres of land to people in 160 acre parcels. And if they lived on that land for five years and established a building on it, they owned it for $18. The Homestead Act changed agriculture, changed America. But then on May 15th of 1862, President Lincoln signed the law that established the Department of Agriculture, the Department of the People, as Mr. Lincoln called it. That happened on May 15th. But on July 1st of that year, the President signed the Pacific Railway Transportation Act. That was the forerunner of the first transcontinental railroad in the United States, knowing that if people were homesteading out in the prairies, they had to have a way to get there and ship goods out of there. Oh, but there's one more. The next day, July 2nd of 1862, President Lincoln signed an act that has probably saved more lives on the planet than any other act of legislation. He signed the Morrill Act establishing the land-grant university system in the United States. And the research and the developments and the improvements in food production have literally saved billions of lives. Did all of this during the Civil War. Amazing. Sorry I never had the chance to uh, meet and interview him. <laughs> I want to close by talking a moment about leadership. Uh, talking to Wendell Shaman earlier today, he reminded me that he had gone through the uh, Illinois Agricultural Leadership Foundation program, and I served on that board for 30 years. And I'm so proud of, again, the people that have gone through the program and the accomplishments that they have achieved. Because in addition to teaching people skills, in whatever profession they choose, we have to teach everyone leadership. Because I worry sometimes about the erosion of strong moral leadership in this country. And that's what our graduates from this college will be asked to do in addition to applying their skills. They'll ask to be leaders. And just several quotes to remind you of the importance of leadership. The one that many of us remember, of course, Vince Lombardi. I lived and worked in Green Bay from 1956 to 60 and then moved to WGN in Chicago. But in 1960, as they say in Green Bay, that was the year God came to town. <laughs> His name was Vince Lombardi. And Vince said, leaders are not born, they are made, and they are made just like anything else through hard work. And that's the price we'll have to pay to achieve that goal or any goal. A lady legislature, a legislator in South Carolina said this, 
in 1970. Leaders are called to stand in that lonely place between the no longer and the not yet and intentionally make decisions that will bind, forge, move, and create history. We are not called to be popular. We are not called to be safe. We are not called to follow. We are the ones called to take risks. We are the ones called to change attitudes, to risk displeasures. We are the ones called to gamble our lives for a better world. And then three more. There is nothing more demoralizing than a leader who can't clearly articulate why we're doing what we're doing. Communications is so important. I think every student should major in communicating, in expressing. Sometimes it gets you into trouble. Being Norwegian, I've made a living telling Ole Lena stories. And uh, you talk about miscommunication. Ole and Lena went to a marriage counseling weekend sponsored by the Lutheran Church of the Windy Prairie that never ends. And, uh, and in the opening session, the pastor challenged them by saying, you need to know the likes and dislikes of your partner. So he said, I'll begin by saying to the men, what is your wife's favorite flower? And Ole nudged Lena and said, is it still gold medal all purpose? <laughs> that response led him to the divorce court. Leadership is the activity of influencing people to cooperate toward some goal which they come to find desirable. Everett Dirksen, oh, one of my favorites. Got to interview Everett when he was a senator. And he said, I am a man of fixed and unbending principles, the first of which is to be flexible at all times. <laughs> And finally, leaders are visionaries with a poorly developed sense of fear and no concept of the odds against them. They make the impossible happen. The impossible is happening here today because you dreamed big, but you can't dream big enough. Thank you very much.